Welcome to this podcast where director Jeff T. Thomas chats with some of the most talented TV and film directors in the industry. This is an in-depth look at how they got into the business, as well as sharing some of the most defining moments in their career. This is The Director's Podcast. From growing up as one of seven children in Chicago to accepting an Emmy for outstanding directing in Hollywood, my next guest has written and directed numerous plays in New York City. He was a creative director at one of the world's largest advertising agencies and has directed commercials and music videos for the likes of Janet Jackson, LL Cool J and Bob Dylan. He has written and created his own television dramas and has directed nearly 200 TV episodes and three movies. He has won the DGA Award and two Emmys for Outstanding Direction of a Drama Series. He has additional nominations for nine DGA Awards and six Emmys. He has been honored with three NAACP Image Awards, three Peabody's, two Humanitas Prizes and one WGA nomination. And if that wasn't enough, he was inducted into the NAACP Image Hall of Fame and served as the first black president of the Directors Guild of America. I asked Paris Barkley, what was the first moment he realized that he wanted to work in the film industry? It, it really began with television. And it's odd that it begins with television and it seems to be, at least right now, concluding with television. Um, I, as a young kid, just watched more than my fair share of TV, uh, partly because I had two parents that worked in Chicago, just outside of Chicago, we grew up. And since they were working all the time, sometimes at night, sometimes two jobs, we were babysat by the television. And I had six brothers and sisters, and so it was a collective babysitting device uh, and was a lot less expensive than a human. So what we spent a lot of time doing was watching reruns of sitcoms, you know, uh, The Andy Griffith Show, Dick Van Dyke. And we were the first uh, family to have a color television on our block. I know it sounds super old when I say that, but it's really just the early 60s and a lot of televisions were still black and white. And so sometimes kids from the neighborhood would come over to watch things that were in color, like The Wizard of Oz. And many of them had never seen The Wizard of Oz transform from black and white into color. And it was always our joy to watch them see that magic happen. And I have to say, that's one of the seminal memories I have as a kid, the magic of that particular movie, the decision that they made to start it in black and white and to go to color uh, amazed and interested me about the process and the people behind it. Um, I also wrote a lot of music, which has also been a huge part of my life. I wrote a lot of songs and I created little musicals even when I was in seventh grade. And uh, the music life that I had from playing like the Magnus chord organ to the piano, to the trombone, to the clarinet, to the guitar, all of which I was teaching myself. That's another thing that I now see as sort of seminal to um, my decision to eventually become a director and my style of directing. It was all that music that I heard in my head and all that music that I wanted to write um, became uh, later on expressed in episodes that always, always have been musical, even when there was no music to be had there. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, in the meantime, I also had a paper route. I actually had five paper routes. And with my paper route money, I would go to the movies on Saturday. And when I went to the movies, generally at the Harvey Theater, uh, there, I'd go for the double bill so I could just stay there and eat popcorn and watch two films. And they were usually paired together like it would be, you know, Thunderball and You Only Live Twice or Goldfinger. And I would just sit there and just um, get lost, usually in the second or third row, oddly enough, just where the movie was really big and really present to me. Um, that was a hideaway and that became a love. I do remember seeing Jaws in the Harvey Theater, and I think that's another seminal moment in my uh, my filmmaking development because I don't generally like to be scared, but for some reason I enjoy being scared by that movie. And I became fascinated by how that happened. So I read the book, and then I read the book about the making of the movie. Even before I was thinking about being a filmmaker, I just wanted to explore how it was done and why that was so compelling to me. Um, those kind of things, you know, kept going on and on. I eventually went to college. How old were you at this point when you were at the cinema? Oh, you? I mean, in the early teens. Wow. 11, 12, 13, 14. Around the time I was 14, I started sliding into some adult 
uh, films like Midnight Cowboy, which I saw in the theater, which I don't know how I got in, but somehow I got in. Uh, and I also read the book of Midnight Cowboy because I was also very interested in in that. I didn't know I was interested in the filmmaking. I just thought I was interested in the story and the people. But what I know now, because I keep seeing that I'm recreating scenes from that movie in my work, I realized that that was a seminal influence. Um, so I'm in my early teens. I'm watching tons of movies now, adding to my television. And all I'm getting is this sort of, this dictionary of images in my mind that's building. Um, so eventually I was, uh, I went to college. I went to Harvard College, which was good for me because Harvard is a school where if you get in, they don't like to kick you out. So uh, I didn't go to very many classes. I was, a, I was the kind of kid who took the easiest courses, usually in English and American literature, which was my area of concentration. And I went to a lot of movies and I did a lot of plays. And Harvard did have the Harvard Square Theater, which is right across the street, which had a lot of beautiful double bills. And I remember seeing my black exploitation films that I had loved as a kid. Again, now as double bills, you'd get the Mac and coffee. You know, you'd get Sweet Sweet Back's badass song, and it might be paired with, you know, Superfly. So not only would they do that, but they would do sophisticated double bills too of films I'd never seen. Like I remember vividly seeing all that jazz and Lenny and thinking, wow, one guy did this. One guy directed these two, again, very starkly different movies. It was amazing. So Double Bills were my personal favorites throughout my whole life. I love to see two movies cleverly put together. That's where I also met the French New Wave, where I met the Jules Régime and, and uh, the 400 Blows. And also that's where I met Ingmar Bergman in the Harvard Square Theater and Persona and Scenes from a Marriage, I remember. And that's where I met Citizen Kane. I had not seen Citizen Kane until I was in college and I saw it at the Harvard Square Theater and I said, hmm, that's a hell of a movie. It was this, would you go and watch these movies in the day by yourself or at night with oh, friends? Oh yeah, the, usually it would be in the evening. You know, we'd go with a group of kids and we'd see what the double bill was. They put out a little calendar and you could see what the two movies were for the day and it just depended upon the day. Sometimes I didn't have class on Tuesdays or Thursdays, so I'd go on a Monday night. you just look and see, oh, they're doing Jaws and Close Encounters and you'd go, or they're doing a Robert Altman thing and you'd go. It's just It just depended upon what really kind of pleased us in the beginning. Or sometimes, you know, because I was a big fan of Sidney Poitier and back in the day, my father was obsessed with him. So we, whenever Lilies of the Field came on television, we would watch it or to serve with love. If they had a film like that, that I also remembered from my childhood, I'd run to the Harvard Square Theater and see it again with new eyes. So uh, it was kind of cool. Uh, and all the time I'm still writing music. I'm still composing for the theater. I'm still involved in that. The theater is starting to become something more interesting, which is also seminal to my development because I did 17 musicals in the time that I was at Harvard, including the Hasty Pudding Show, which I, I did a couple of, of times with just doing the music. And so you can see I didn't have time to actually go to classes. So. What, type of, what type of music did you specialize in? It was all for the theater, but we did we did different styles depending upon what the show was, whether I was doing an adaptation of Machiavelli's The Prince, which I did with uh, my then roommate, Arthur Golden, who later would go on to write memoirs of a geisha. But then I'd also do super, you know, silly, crazy musicals in a Pirandello kind of tradition. So it was just everything varied. I, I love the eclecticism of it all. The Hasty Pudding Show was always a, a, a pastiche of different genres of music with a full orchestra. And, and that was a great experience. So I'm watching all these movies. I'm writing these musicals. I'm having fun. I asked Paris what it was like to hear his music for the very first time in front of a live audience. It was always the sits probe. If you know the theater, the sits probe is the time that I was most excited. That's the first time the cast gets to sing the music with the orchestra. And for me in the Hasty Pudding Show, which was, you know, really a quasi-professional production at Harvard, it was, you know, at that time we spent $100,000 doing this, which was a lot of money at that time, doing this particular production. And we hired a professional arranger and there was a real orchestra. And suddenly, you know, they're doing the overture. And I have to say, I'm thinking of it now, I'm getting a little bit of, of, of chills in, in my arms just thinking about it, but there's something about that moment for the first time they come out and they sing and the orchestra plays. 
that is exhilarating. Even if I didn't write the music, uh, I directed a production of Company at, at Harvard, and I just remember the thrill of having that sits probe where the orchestra plays the opening number from Company and the cast sings it with the orchestra for the first time after all that piano. There's just a, it's, it's electric, and uh, it is one of my favorite moments in, in every musical that I've done. So that was your first directing gig then, was it? It was, a, it was that play? No, I directed a number of plays that I had written and some that I hadn't written when I was at Harvard. I didn't really love directing at that time because I was way too selfish. And despite the fact that directors are thought of as being very ego-driven and selfish, uh, I really wanted to be, um, you know, in control. That was my idea of what a director should be. The director should be the person who controls every aspect of the performance. So I'd written the music, I'd written the lyrics, I'd written the book, and I wanted people to do it my way. And that was like, you know, somewhat effective at the college level. But as I've learned as my career goes on, it's perhaps the least effective approach to directing that you can have. Um, but I didn't know it that. So it wasn't quite as much fun as it is now because of my own selfishness. So. That's just something I have to look back on. How, do, how, did, you le- how did you learn that lesson? Um, how did I learn that lesson? I didn't learn that lesson until quite quite a while. I'd say probably uh, in the middle of my music video time. So let me get, get you forward to that. So I, I, I left Harvard. I went to New York. I was destined to be a composer and a lyricist, and I wanted to really work in the theater. I took a job in advertising as a copywriter just to sort of make money. I was being paid $18,500 a year, I remember vividly, which I thought was a lot of money in order to write copy for the Gray Advertising Agency. And at night, I was going to write my plays. I was going to write my musicals. I got into the ASCAP Musical Theater Workshop, so I had teachers like Stephen Sondheim and Stephen Schwartz and I mean, Charles Strauss, and it was a fantastic learning opportunity. And my plays started to get done. I got two musicals produced. I got one produced at the Manhattan Theater Club, just in a workshop with Jason Alexander starring in it. Um, and I thought, I'm on my way. And Sondheim came to that musical, and he just really tore me up and said it was completely not good, uh, <laughs> which broke my heart a little bit, but he was right, and he was my mentor. And uh, he explained to me what needed to be done to really write a musical, to really have the central heating a musical requires. And he suggested that I write a musical about black people because he said, if I did that, I would be the best black musical writer on Broadway because there were none, uh, except uh, Charles Smalls who'd done The Wiz. So he said, your competition is much less fierce. So I did do that. I I wrote a musical based on uh, a, a Richard Wright short story called Almost a Man about a boy who wants a gun. And I did not direct it, uh, and it was beautifully directed, actually. And it was very successful at the Soho Repertory Theater Company, and it got one really bad review, which happened to be in the New York Times from Mel Gussell, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, and that was the only review that the rights holder, who was uh, Richard Wright's widow, who lived in France, saw, and she stopped us from ever doing the play again. So that was heart disheartening and, and sort of slowed down my musical theater efforts for a while. So what was I going to do? I kept writing commercials and, and rising up the chain in advertising. And eventually in 1985, I got a client, um, Liz Taylor, who had just started a new foundation, the American Foundation for AIDS Research. And uh, we, pro bono, were going to do a commercial and it's going to have her. And it was going to be the first commercial she had ever done because she hadn't done Black Diamonds or any of the stuff she did later at that point. Um, And so we hired a director who had been someone who had done a lot of commercials for us. He bailed, and I ended up being the director of the commercial. So really, my first directing gig came from being a copywriter and came out of necessity because the director was uh, made unavailable by Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, So I went to Los Angeles to shoot Elizabeth Taylor in her very first television commercial. Needless to say, I was familiar with her oeuvre, Uh, (laughs) And uh, it was a commercial for this foundation that was trying to prevent AIDS, the American Foundation for AIDS Research, that I had written. So uh, I arrive on the set, and Elizabeth Taylor is there uh, a few hours late, but nevertheless there. And she doesn't want to do the commercial. She wants to do what she has now written, which was a one-line sort of tag. And she said, that's what I think it should be. And I very gently said, I think it's wonderful. I think it's 
really expert what you're saying. Let's film that, and then we'll just film the other the other after that, and just pick it up. She said, okay. <laughs> so I learned immediately that even when dealing with megastars, give them what they want, and then maybe you can get what you want later. And so she taught me basically how to direct Elizabeth Taylor in one afternoon. She sat on the stage, and she looked around, and she said, Paris, I need to speak to you. That light over there, it needs to go down. That one needs to go out. Uh, and, sh- and sure enough, she was right, because she knew how the lights needed to be to make her look like Elizabeth Taylor, which was another lesson I learned, that, you know, long-running long running stars in the series kind of know where the shit needs to be. They kind of know what makes them look good, especially the women, and they know what doesn't, and they even know what lenses you're using, so don't try to fool them. And so my debut appeared on ABC once as a pro bono commercial, and then it was never aired again because it was quite controversial. It had people with guns to their heads saying AIDS does not discriminate, basically. And uh, it was a, a game of Russian roulette that I think had been inspired by the deer hunter. And it was just too much, even though Elizabeth Taylor came on at the end. So my first directorial debut was uh, a disaster, uh, at least successfully, but I did kind of like it. I did enjoy the putting together of the whole thing, and I did enjoy working with Elizabeth Taylor and the talent, and I thought this might be something I could continue to do if I really put my mind to it. Paris continued to work his way up the ranks of the advertising agency and soon became its creative director. This was one of the most prestigious jobs at an agency who also happened to be one of the biggest in the world. So uh, what happened then? Then... I'm now a creative director in an advertising agency, and a friend of mine, Joel Hidman, says, hey, why don't you come and make music videos with me? I have a music video company. We can create a separate music video company with you as a partner. You're white, you're black, I'm white. We call black and white television, and we can make music videos. And you can be the black guy, and you can make music videos for all the black artists who don't currently have um, uh, a black director, because there were virtually, you know, very, very few black directors working, even though rap was exploding here in the late 80s and 90s. So I said, that sounds like a really good idea. I'll leave my now $100,000 job to do nothing and to 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 make music videos. Why not? It's, it sounds very delightful, I think. Uh, and also, I was using a lot of drugs and drinking a lot at this time, so that made it extra, you know, yeah, I could make a decision like that and not worry about the consequences. So a very high, very drunk uh, Paris Barkley becomes a music video director, and for six months, we didn't get any jobs. <laughs> that was the first, we had a company and a phone and a, a, a logo and no jobs. Uh, <laughs> up until finally, I got like a commission for a small rap video and then Kid and Play, I did a little video for, which became very important later on in my career. And finally, Andrew Bernstein, who's a director friend of mine, who's also music videos, who had just done Love Shack a little while ago, got offered a video from LL Cool J called Big Old Butt. But he had already done uh, a very big butt video, uh, Babies Got Back, so he didn't want to do Big Old Butt. So he gave me Big Old Butt. Well, at least he recommended me to do Big Old Butt. So I go over to Russell Simmons, who's Todd, LL Cool J's manager, and LL Cool J, and I sell myself as the director to do Big Old Butt with Adam's help, because Adam told me a few ideas he didn't get to use for Master. I think it was Master P. I can't remember who did Babies Got Back. But anyway, so I got Big Old Butt. That became my first LL Cool J video, and it became one of eight, which was very, very exciting. And that became a, a long ongoing relationship where we developed a friendship and we developed different kinds of music videos and different genres. And suddenly the company was taken off. Suddenly the company is now a million dollar company a year and all kinds of black directors and women black directors are getting work through this company. And we put together a very mixed crew. We were non-union, so we didn't have to worry about those pesky unions getting in our way. Uh, But we did want to give people experience so they could eventually get in the unions. That was our thinking. But success in music videos in the 80s came with its trappings, and soon Paris found himself, let's say, enjoying himself just a little too much. (laughs) Music videos in the 80s were fueled by drugs and by alcohol. And when I would say rap, I would get like, you know, a vodka handed to me on the rocks, martini, boom. Uh, And then I would go off on some sort of spree using the few thousand dollars that I got from directing the music videos. It never was terribly lucrative. Most of it we poured back into the company. Um, 
But actually, my partner Joel Hinman was, again, a critical force in my getting sober because he had just set up an insurance uh, an insurance uh, deal for our company, which we didn't have, so that our directors could have insurance. And he said, hey, I just got insurance. Why don't you go to rehab? He didn't say it in quite that many words. <laughs> but he basically said it in that many words. And things were happening, like Kwame, the boy genius, who was a young rapper that I had done my very first music video for. Whenever he would come to the office, he would replace all of the vodka bottles and booze with water while we weren't looking. And then we go to get a drink and we have water and it's like, Kwame! And sure enough, it was him. Uh, so people were sending me signs and signals and relationships were falling apart and my nose was bleeding all the time. And I finally got the message that I needed some help. So I was lucky enough to get to the Smithers Clinic in New York, which was uh, which is where all the Mets went at the time. I don't know if you are a Mets fan, but I was at the time and Dwight Gooden and Keith Hernandez and, and everybody was going to the Smithers Clinic to get sober. So I went there too. And that helped me. And I actually haven't drunk since the day that I went in there. What was it like writing those music videos at that time? Um, I, I I don't know. It, by the time, you know, when I was directing music videos, I would get sent a track. I'd have to listen to it. I would spend three days coming up mm -hmm. with writing, pitching an idea with five other directors I was always pitching against. Was it the same with you? Yeah, that was that the point? general way that it went with Todd. Uh, he would basically choose, it's going to be you do who does the video, let's work it out. I did the original uh, concept for Mom Said Knock You Out, and it was not unlike um, what has been done later, where actually LL Cool J was going to box an opponent in a ring with a huge boxing match and people and press and all that other stuff. But that was the original concept that Todd bought. But then uh, his manager, then Russell Simmons said, You ain't putting Todd in the ring. What the no, 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 no. Do something else. <laughs> and Todd, of course, is totally game for it. He'll do you know anything, especially something that he thought would be so cool. I said, we're going to shoot like Ragey Bull. It's going to be black and white. It's going to like be crazy. But I couldn't sell it. So eventually, and this is a few days before we're shooting, we just stripped it all away. And it just became blackness and flashes from the darkness and just the boxer and just the mic starkly lit. And it helped that Todd was very late to the, to the music video that day. So I had very few shots as it turns out. So having very few shots made for very long takes, for which I've received massive quantities of praise. So people say, oh, that video, there's a take in it that's 30 seconds long, no rap video had ever done that before. And I just, and I tell them very honestly, I didn't have anything else to cut to. That was the, that, when he did that song, I only had it in two sizes and that's it. So. Uh, <laughs> you, went, you went from chorus to verse. <laughs> Without cutting, yeah. which I don't think I've ever seen in a music video yeah, before. Yeah, we didn't have anything it else. It just carried on over. <laughs> we just didn't have anything to do. And everyone thought it was a decision that we'd made. I think the whole video has 73 or some under 100 cuts, which is very unusual. And it's all because there just wasn't any film. We were just totally winging it. It was shot in one day at Mother Sound Stages in New York. We shot Around the Way Girl, which was the video that came out before it on Saturday. And Mom said, knock you out on Sunday. And that's all that we had. And with all that we had, with Fred Salkin editing it, it became, you know, classically spare. <laughs> yeah, but it worked so well because of that. I think, you know, sometimes when things don't go your way, you find and you discover something that's so much better because of it, right? And over my life and my career, actually, in directing for television, I've often found that, you know, we're running out of time. We have to do this in one or some situation um, seems very, very negative and you end up finding a new way and turning it around. And it ends up being something that when you finally see the piece, you say, oh, I'm so glad we did that. That's so much better than what I would have done with all the elaborate stuff that I had planned. Black and white television took off and Paris was soon directing music videos for other artists such as Bob Dylan, Was Not Was, Janet Jackson and Luther Vandross. Suddenly I was the guy who makes videos for movies. I was doing movies like Mo Money and all these different uh, movies I was doing the videos for which brought me to Hollywood. So now I'm coming to Hollywood quite a bit in my music video life and I'm sort of hot and I've directed Mama Said Knock You Out. So when I directed LL Cool J's Mama Said Knock You Out, which was my last video until recently, I did a video for him a few years ago, but um, everything changed. The video got all sorts of awards from Billboard, from MTV. It was very stark and different and black and white, and uh, although it's actually slightly, slightly brown and sepia, but 
Don't tell Eminem that, who just ripped it off on his latest video. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Mom Said Knock You Out was a huge success for me and for Todd. And it put me in a different sort of pantheon. And people started to say, who's Paris Barkley? And if they looked at the other videos I had done, they say, he's always telling a story. In all these videos with Bob Dylan, it was a guy driving across on Route 30, discovering himself in his sobriety, which was obviously a story that was close to me. So with each of these videos, I tried to tell some kind of story, not just a performance. And that attracted a lot of interest, um, especially the interest of John Wells. John Wells was looking for a director. He was a young, up-and-coming uh, executive producer. He had done China Beach, and he had a new show called Angel Street, which was a detective show set in Chicago. And he saw real music videos that I had done, including Moms to Knock You Out and some other ones that all told a story. And I tell my students now I was using the record company's money to to uh, basically create a reel for myself. And so he liked what he saw. He brought me in. We had a two-hour interview with, with John and with Lydia Woodward. And, and uh, he finally said, OK, we'll give you a shot. And that became my first episode of television, um, Angel Street in Chicago, my hometown, which was kind of great, with Robin Gibbons and Pam Gidley as sort of dueling detectives. What was it like stepping on set for the first time the morning you woke up and you went to that film set and you started blocking the scene? Can you just unpack that a little bit for us? I don't remember that specifically because, uh, you know, I'm old. Um, but I do remember how exciting it was to be in my hometown where my family was and my mother doing my first show. I felt like I had a lot of at least spiritual support. I could go home for dinner. Uh, I do remember that as being great. And the unique thing about Angel Street that John had done, he decided that every scene would be done in one shot. That was going to be the conceit of the show. So this fed into my theater experience and also fed into some of the stuff I'd done in music videos where we didn't have enough time. <laughs> and so that actual um, rule or whatever became a strength for me. So when I came to the set, because I'd been in the theater and I knew how to block things, I knew how to instinctively move the camera to make this happen. And Richard Thorpe, who was the DP, was so excellent and so strong. Later on, he would go on to do ER with John. Um, that I felt very comforted. And had it not been for the fact that the two top stars just did not get along, it would have been an actually uh, terrific premiere experience. How was it received? Did it uh, did it go well for you? Did you th did that lead to other episodes of that, or did you go straight on to another show after that? Funny that you should ask that, Jack. Uh, <laughs> uh, I directed one episode of Angel Street. I think it was the second or third episode. Um, and the show was canceled after um, five episodes. But there was one more episode to be made, even after the show was canceled. And John turned back to me and said, you know, you're not working, Paris. Would you go back to Chicago and do another episode after the show's been canceled <clears throat> with these two stars? And... <laughs> I said, yes, I, I need a job. I'll absolutely do it. So I went back to Chicago and did the final episode, which I don't believe ever aired, actually, of it, the sixth episode of the show after it was canceled, which was also a great learning experience because it's really hard to do a show after a show has been canceled. People just don't really want to do it, but they contractually had to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's just, it. it's just not pretty. There's a sadness and a slowness about everything. So uh, that was my second episode. And then I did work for many months. Yeah. Uh, I think I was at William Morris at the time, and they tried to get me some jobs. It took a while for me to get my next job outside of Angel Street. I think I did Diagnosis Murder or Extreme, which was a show on ABC. I would get a couple of little bites, but they were kind of few and far between. I had a very slow, I didn't immediately get into the mix and start you know, directing all the time. Were you supplementing your income going back to do music videos at the time then? Or were you saying, yeah. I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm only going to do television? Yeah, I would still do music videos. And uh, I had also gotten offered um, uh, a, a movie. And I said, well, this is exciting, I'll do a movie. So I got excited about doing House Party 2, the sequel to House Party. Um, I was slated to direct that, but then I was replaced in, um, in the middle of pre-production. Uh, by the producers who replaced me with themselves and uh, took over. Seeing Paris talk numerous times while he was president of the Directors Guild, he'd always seemed to me as someone who was full of positivity. So I wanted to know how he dealt with such a blow so early on in his career. 
Honestly, it takes a long time. I am I am a cancer, and so I hold grudges for long periods of time, and I am prone to mood swings, believe it or not. I'm in a very good mood today, but generally I'm, I'm prone to mood swings. So, for instance, when I was released from House Party 2, I didn't want to leave my apartment for a long period of time, and I don't think I worked for a year. Um, I take things really badly and really personally, and it's one of my biggest failings personally. I just don't, I don't shake it off very well. Um, so those kinds of losses, I tend to sort of lick my wounds and go inside. I am not as resilient as I'd like to be. I'm, I'm extremely um, sensitive. I'm really a crab without a shell when it comes to rejection. Um, I, I've learned that rejection is God's protection, someone said. And I guess I'm, I'm happy in the long run, but I, I don't do immediately... Uh, well with failure and rejection so I try to avoid them as much as possible and a year of not working what was what was that like at the time well um, to be honest we had a, a little bit of a legal entanglement about my leaving of that and so uh, in the settlement of it I was uh, compensated and had a place to live in a car for that period of time so it's not like I was starving uh, but I also didn't think I was valuable and I started to take it really personally I said well Obviously, I'm inept. Um, I must accept what they have said, that I am uh, a poor director and a poor manager of people, and therefore I must stay in my house and not attempt to try to do this again. That's, you know, my best thinking. I'm 23 years old or something, uh, 24 years old. So, so I've since discovered that what people actually think of me has a lot less to do with what I feel about myself. But at that time, I, I didn't. So um, I watched a lot of television. I went to the movies. I could eat in restaurants. I could drive around. And uh, I spent a lot of time working on staying sober, which I'd gotten sober a few years before then. So uh, I was sober at the time that all this happened. So that became a focus of my day-to-day -day life. Paris eventually overcame that setback and got a job directing the cable movie, The Cherokee Kid. He was then invited to work again with John Wells on what had quickly become the number one show on television, E.R. And if I hadn't had that relationship with him doing Angel Street, he would not have trusted me with the, what was then the juggernaut number one show on television. So I was very fortunate in that he remembered me and he brought me back to actually direct, actually I directed three or four episodes of E.R to come back and do that show with George Clooney there and Juliana Margulies, and it being a show that was seen by 40 million people every Thursday night. It was like one in six Americans were watching ER live on television, uh, which was awesome. And that was the experience that actually launched me into having a career and not just being a dilettante television director. If I had to do it all over again, I probably would have become a writer instead of a director, actually. But, you know, fate has sort of and the hands of Elizabeth Taylor kind of turned me to being a director. But I was, you know, an English major. I actually did a lot of writing. I studied with great people, Ann Beattie and Paul Theroux and the playwright William Alfred when I was at Harvard. And I did very well um, in the writing division. And then I was writing my own plays and musicals. But somehow I sort of got segued into directing. But even then, in the 80s, when I was still just being a copywriter, I created a half hour comedy pilot called Just Us for my friend Alan Campbell, who was uh, a young actor who was then hot uh, from being on a half hour show. And we sold it to CBS and we almost got the pilot produced, but alas, we did not. That was my first experience kind of with network television. But since then, I've had opportunities to create shows. I co-created with Stephen Bochco and Nicholas Wooten uh, the show City of Angels, which was a, a black hospital drama set in L.A., um, we were going to be very groundbreaking and we were most groundbreaking in our casting because we gave one of the first television roles to Viola Davis, to Octavia Spencer, another lead role for Blair Underwood, Vivica Fox. We had Hill Harper and Maya Rudolph in the cast. It was actually an extraordinary uh, group of talented people on a show I created. That show lasted two seasons. It wasn't the best experience for me. Again, my control issues reared their ugly head. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it was a show that I got on television that I created. I'm very interested, even now, in creating shows that more directly express the things I care about. I did a pilot for Showtime maybe 10 or so years ago called Hate about the hate crimes unit of the New York Police Department, starring Marsha Gay Harden. 
that I co-wrote with James DeMonico, who is uh, the author of The Purge, all of The Purge. Uh, James and I did this sort of really gripping and ridiculously innovative uh, <laughs> procedural based on examining hate crimes in the New York Police Department. And it had a great conceit in that you could actually hear the inner thoughts of the detectives as they actually interviewed people and as they they went about their daily life and, and simultaneously there was a track that was actually what they were thinking, which sometimes was in concert and oftentimes was in conflict. Um, and that was a really fantastic experience. We did it for Showtime. It did not go forward. I think it was deemed to be too network, but it dealt with the kinds of issues you could never do on network television. So I would love to go back and do that again. And you directed that as well as great. I did direct yeah. that. How, how did you find the process being different uh, directing the material you'd written compared to directing other people's material? So much better. Yeah. You don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to. But I usually, I usually write with a collaborator when I'm writing for television. So I had James to bounce ideas off of. When we were writing it, we would put the screen on uh, the big television in my then study. And we both work in our computers and either of us could change it. So we were very collaborative about uh, that process. So normally I had some other person to talk to, but it's just so much easier to just completely fulfill your vision. And I do desperately want to get back to that. Not that I struggle with the visions of others, because the visions of others often exceed my own. There, there is no greater writer that I've had the experience of working with than David Milch. And there is no way I can presume to write anything of the quality that he writes. So if David Milch is going to give me a script, even if, incre if it's incredibly late, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to clap, and I'm going to make it into something wonderful. Uh, but not every writer is David Milch. And uh, I really look forward to the time when I can actually develop my own ideas from start to screen. Well, that's incredibly insightful for part one. Thank you so much, Paris Barkley. We'll come back in part two and uh, we'll talk a little bit about your process and uh, some of the more defining Yay. moments of your career. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'm not going to ask you to give it a five-star review or for you to subscribe. And there is no Patreon site. I created this show to help people who don't have mentors or role models. People who want to work in the film industry but don't know which path they should take. So if you know someone who might like or benefit from the show, all I'm asking is for you to share it with them. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be listening to their story. Remember 19 media.